Buenos días a todos y todas. Morning, everyone. So I am from Puerto Rico. That's where this charming accent comes from. So Puerto Rico, if you don't know, it's in the Caribbean. It's a sister island of the Dominican Republic. So is there any Caribbean representation here? Woohoo! Yes, we'll take that. Thank you. So um, I was born and raised in Puerto Rico. We recently moved to the, well, recently eight years ago. We moved to Carmel, Indiana, and, um, and I commute every day, pray for me. So um, in, in, in Puerto Rico, it's a small island. It's 100 miles for, you know, by, by um, 35 miles. It's not big. Um, I think I have a picture or two about Puerto Rico with the flag, so you get acquainted with it. And, you know, part of Old San Juan, I love my island. Puerto Rico is beautiful. You should go there. Actually, we, the sociologists call it the commuter's nation because they can go back and forth so easily because, you know what, there are Puerto Rican citizens. I mean, there is no Puerto Rican citizenship. There's only American citizenship since 1917. Okay? So we commute back and forth. There's always an aunt, an, aunt, an auntie. There's always a, a, an uncle. And after Hurricane Maria, the population dropped dramatically because it's so easy to go back and forth. So it's, um, it's just very, very normal to be walking on the streets and listening an accent that is so familiar. And you, hey, you're, you're from Puerto Rico, don't you? Because there's a particular accent. We aspire the S's. We, don't, we say instead of buenos, we decimos Instead of buenos dias, the symbol buenos dias. There's no S there. And there you know it's a Puerto Rican. There you know that there's a Puerto Rican in the, in, in the room. Now, in Puerto Rico, um, we, we never celebrated the Hispanic Heritage Month. Is there no reason to celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month? Because there's no one asking you, are you Hispanic? Are you Latino? Or where are you from? No, 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 one has, no one cares, actually, where you're from. So it wasn't until we moved here that for the first time I realized there is a Hispanic Heritage Month. Shame on me. I'm so sorry. Um, but it, it was a process of learning and growing and understanding what's this Heritage Month about? Because you know, I'm proud of my Puerto Rican heritage. You know, we, you know, we are a mix of so many cultures. You can find, you know, you can find black Puerto Ricans, white Puerto Ricans, ginger, blonde, blue eye, green eye, uh, shapes, sizes, every, in everything. So I started growing in, the, trying to grow in understanding what does Hispanic Heritage Month mean? What do we need to celebrate to get acquainted with the realities of, of, of this new context? And that was, you know, eight years ago. Now, this is, this is going somewhere, don't worry. Um, Last weekend, we went to Chicago. We love Chicago. I mean, we live three hours away from Chicago, which means you can um, enjoy the benefits of the great city without living in it. So we can just come back after, you know, a good weekend. We were taking a family photo shoot for, for autumn, and we had a great time. What we didn't know is the Hispanic Heritage Month started on the 15th. And, I mean, we saw movement on the streets. We saw, you know, you know people and crowds and, and, and fireworks. And we looked in, our, you know, we asked Google, you know, the, the almighty Google, Google, what, 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 what's going on in Chicago, Hispanic Heritage Month? But then Google also added an extra line that says, and Mexicans, they celebrate their independence on the 16th. And, oh, they celebrate independence on the 16th. That's awesome. You know, fantastic. Well, naive of me. It is awesome. It is fantastic. But I, we were out of the city on, on Saturday. We were just out enjoying Evanston, doing, you know, in the pier, doing cool stuff, having great meals. And we wanted to come back to our hotel, which was on Michigan Avenue. Anyone from Chicago here? Yeah, there you go, Chicago ones. Okay, so we were, uh, we were trying to go back to the city, and we realized that, you know, there was a lot of traffic. It was 7.30. It was a lot of tra uh, traffic. And the first exit to, to go to downtown was closed. There was a barricade, policemen, police officers. And they said, this is Chicago. This is bad. Police is out there. So I did my, my doctoral studies in Trinity in Evangelical Divinity School in Chicago. So I heard lots of stories about Chicago police. So this exit is closed, so maybe, you know, so, you know there, there was a shooting, something bad happened. Next exit, close. Third exit, close. There's an hour now, we are on the street, bumper to bumper. I mean, Puerto Rico traffic is heavy, but Chicago traffic, Hispanic Heritage Month, the 16th. 
Lord have mercy. <laughs> we were bumper to bumper. And, in the, and, and again, we, we, our resource, Google, Google, what is going on? Downtown is closed. How on earth are we going to get to our hotel? And it, it's, 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 we, we have a family of four, you know, our two, our two children, which are um, 14 and 16, and my wife and I, and I then just, you know, the, the tension started to increase within the, 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 uh, our, our minivan, our, our car. It just started to increase, like, how are we going to go in? I mean, and, and I've heard so many stories about, you know, uh, um, um, uh, the Irish police here in Chicago, I mean, they're, not, they're rude and they're rough, and uh, my biases started to uh, arise and emerge, right? And, and, and all of a sudden, you know, I started, like, complaining. I mean, this city of Chicago, why, cannot they, why can't they be more organized? I mean, they can allocate a park. They can go to Wrigley Park over there, and, you know, and they have their celebration. And someone else in the, in the, in the car says, do you think it's the city's problem? I think it's, you know, the Hispanic Heritage Month problem. I said, no, I don't think it is. You know, they have, to, they can celebrate, of course, the independence. Oh, but celebrate this way? Oh, you have no idea. We seldom have drama, but we had drama. Tension increased, and things started to heat up, and two hours, three hours, it took us close to four hours to get into downtown. Four hours. And I mean, I stepped out of the car so many times to talk with a policeman about, hey, I have my family with me. We've been, you know, trying to get in. And all I got was, it's so hard because there are 60,000 people in, in, in Michigan Avenue. You won't be able to get there. But, you know, I'm going to let you pass. You need to talk to the other police, uh, police officer. I don't know how many conversations I had. Long story short, we made it to the, to the hotel, took a shower, uh, well, some of us took a shower, um, went to bed, just waiting for, for the next day. I mean, new mercies every morning, right? Oh, Lord, thank you. There's some new morning every day. And I woke up early before anyone else woke up, and I started thinking and meditating on the last night. And I realized, oh, Lord, I need to confess. I think I, I just messed up. I accused the Mexicans, and I accused the Hispanic area, and I accused the, the city and the police and the biases. Lord, I confess to you. And I was very specific on the things that I understood I needed to confess. Oh, and also my family. I think that I added to the tension. I'm so sorry, Lord. Forgive me. I want to do better. I want to a, be a better dad. I want to be, 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 be a better husband. I mean, 23 years. Uh, Woke up, to, um, went downstairs, bought coffee, some danishes and um, croissants, came back up to the room, and, um, you know, we started having breakfast in the room until my oldest son said, I want to share with you something. I want to apologize to you all on the way I behaved last night. I was selfish. I was thinking about me and how I felt. And I added and contributed to the tension. And I allowed it to escalate. And I'm going to own my fault and my, what I contributed to that. I could have done better. So please forgive me. I'm supposed to be the pastor. He's preaching. He's not only preaching, he's embodying confession. You know, confession has a bad rep. It, you know, it, the perception that we're weak, the perception that we are just, uh, that what are they going to think about me? What are others going to think about me? The perception of, of vulnerability. I didn't, I mean, I confess to God. He knows my sins. He knows my heart. I confess to him. And between God and I, it is well with my soul, but it wasn't with my community. 
And I didn't have the courage to initiate that. But God knew that we needed it. And my son started it. And because he started it, the power of confession was poured in that room. And then my daughter, me, my wife, everyone started. And their relationship started to heal because we recognized our contributions and we confessed to each other. You see, there's, there's two ways in this confession. Our confessions of sins, our confessions to each, to each other. What I want to tell you clearly this morning is that Psalm 32, that was beautifully read in English and Spanish, says this, confession is the power that guides us toward experiencing the richness of life within the community of the forgiven. We had the most beautiful Sunday, not because we were just getting out of Chicago traffic, but because we reconnected with each other through confession. Confession is power. Confession is power. Psalm 32 is the experience of, a, of, of confessing. It is said that it, is, it was one of the songs, one of the songs that was sang during the bringing the offering to God and asking for forgiveness. It is said also that it was, you know, um, it, it is one of um, David's psalms of confession. But if, if you paid attention to it, it describes someone whose heart is heavy confesses to God and is freed and liberating, but it also expresses everything that comes with it. Confession is power. Is power. So in the next few minutes, I'm going to hit the, how do we say it, the uh, pedal to the metal, and we're going to use the framework of Psalm 32 and this confession, this beautiful song of confession, and and trying to observe the life of Peter. Anyone knows Peter in the scripture, in the Bible? Jesus' disciple, Peter, yes? Yeah? Okay, Peter, the fisherman. See the moment he confessed and what happened afterward, and let's see some evidence of power through confession. If it's true what the psalmist experienced, then we should also see it through the lives of others as well. And it is... It is um, God's calling for you and I today that we can understand and embrace the discipline of confession to get access to that power. Let's start with confession. He says, I'm heavy in Psalm 32. I'm heavy. I need to confess. I need to acknowledge my sins. I will confess it to you. And you know what? He says, and he forgave me. In Luke 5, we have, we have Peter in front of Jesus. Jesus invades his, his workplace, his marketplace, and says, can I use your boat? And then he says, can I use your nets? And, 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 and Peter, is, he's very, he, he doubts, he has doubts about, uh, about Jesus' experience with fish and said, well, we've been fishing, we know that. You keep teaching. But since you say so, we are going to do so and throw the net. Of course, the surprise, the miracle, mir miraculous catch, and all of the feet and the nets are breaking, and we know the story. Other fishermen came to help out, but Peter did something. He could have said, whoa, that's awesome. Thank you. Guys, let's feast. Or he could have said, well, this is in payment for using my boat. But now he fell to his knees and said, get away from me. I'm a sinful man. Now, take into consideration that this is public. That he is not in, in a room outside. He doesn't pull Jesus aside and say, Jesus, let's have a conversation. My bad. No, he, he said publicly, and there are bystanders, and there are passerbys, and there's family and colleagues and peers, and there's John as well, who's going to turn into a disciple, and James is too there observing. There are also in awe, and through the confession of Peter, also James and John joined the crowd, joined Jesus' disciples. He said, oh, this is, this is, this is something else. 
They, he confesses, I'm a sinful man. I doubted you. I doubted who you are. You know, the, I cannot be in contact, in proximity with the holiness, with such amazing power to what Jesus responds is, you be fisherman, just follow me. If it was you or me, and we receive a confession like that, we say, oh, that's okay. But he didn't say that's okay. He said, come follow me. He said, don't be afraid. Go away. He was afraid of the power. He felt weak and vulnerable. And he, Jesus steps closer rather than stepping away and says, don't be afraid. Let's go for a journey. Confession is power. Transforms our lives. Now, people usually ask, so how do I confess? And what's the difference between confessing um, to God and confessing to others? Now, that's where's my, I'm glad you asked because there's a slide about that. Next slide, please. So here, basically, I want to really quick tell you, we confess our sins to God. And we confess our sins by saying, we, we confess to God what we did wrong. We ask for the Holy Spirit for conviction. We are very specific. This is what happened. This is what I did. This is how I feel. We repent of what di we did wrong. It's not only enough to say this is what I did. It's that this is wrong and I repent. I'm going to turn around 180 from that. Uh, we want uh, to acknowledge also in, in our prayer and confession to God how how our wrongs doings affected, affected others. We ask then for forgiveness. You know that there's, that's a critical step. Can you forgive me, Lord? I need your forgiveness. And then we receive God's grace. There's no longer need to carry that with us. Trust in the Lord of the psalmist, in the Lord of Peter, who is also available for you and I today. Trust in his grace. You are forgiven. But what about others? Let's go back to the, uh, to the hotel room. I fix things with God, but what about others? We confess to others our offenses against them. We, we are specific. Hey, I need to have a conversation with you. I did this, and I was wrong. I own, we own 100% of our contribution to the issue. My son did that. He said, I added, I added with this comment in particular. We ask for forgiveness. Can you forgive me? We receive also God's grace. And we join the community of the forgiveness. There are so many similar aspects to confessions, but they are different in context and in content. But both are very much needed for us to live in community with God and community with each other. Now, that's what confession's about. Now, let's explain how this confession is power and let's journey and follow the steps of, of the psalmist and observe Peter's, um, Peter's journey after confession. So, confession is protection. The psalmist says, Therefore, let all who faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely, the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. After we confess, we enter into God's protection. There's something that covers us. And that something is God's presence. And Simon had an experience like that. And in John 6, 8, we have, we have, we have Peter. Sorry, Peter. We have Simon Peter, who um, also had a conversation um, with Jesus. And this is the moment in which um, Jesus is preaching. His sermon is tough. He, there are so many things going on, and people started to leave. And, and, and Jesus asked, would you, would you leave as well? Are you, you know, so concerned? Would you leave as well? And he says, you know what? We cannot leave because we feel safe in you. I wonder how do you feel today? 
exposed or protected. Confession is the power that ushers us in the, into the community of the forgiven for us to be protected. Next, it's orientation. Forgiveness offers orientation. The psalmist says in Psalm 32, I will guide you with my, with my eye. I will, I will counsel you with my loving eye. Peter experienced something similar in his journey with Jesus. In Matthew 14, verses 30 to 32, they were in the, the, in the boat. They saw the winds. They saw the waters. They saw the waves. They were afraid. And this, this Peter who believed in this Jesus and trusted in Jesus is now, you know, doubting and hesitating, are we going to die or not? And, we, and, and then all of a sudden, he, he sees Jesus walking in the waters and said, no, we're, we're not going to die. This guy is who he said he is, and I'm going to do the same thing. Can I join? And Jesus says, yeah, sure, come on. And he stepped into the waters, and that would have been awesome, awesome. And an awesome experience. But we know what happened. He started to drown. He started, you know, he, he got afraid again. He saw the waters. He was like, oh, no, I know how this usually goes, and it's really bad. And he started to drown, and Jesus, you know, held his hand, lifted him up, and said, hey, why did you doubt? Why did you, have, did you doubt? You have little faith. Confession brings orientation to our hearts, to our lives. And you know what? Orientation comes in unexpected ways. And usually, orientation from God, counsel from God, comes when we feel we are drowning. Where the, when the waters are just above our head, and we say, this is unbearable, seek for God's orientation. Is there something that we need to confess? Let's move on. Confession is power. And because it's power... There's also evidence in the psalmist's life, in the psalmist's experience, and in Peter's experience, that it led to witnessing. Witnessing. Rejoice in the Lord. Be glad, all of you righteous, the psalmist says. And in Acts 2.14, after Jesus ascended to the skies, after they waited for the Holy Spirit to, to descend on, on them, it's Peter who stood up and says, let me tell you something. Listen to me. And he witnessed. He witnessed. I wonder if he would have had that same power and boldness if he would have never been vulnerable and confess. Is it possible to, to, be, to, to be that bold for God and witness as bold through weakness? Yes. It's a must. The witnesses, he witnesses God's faithfulness that turns a transgressor into a righteous person. Confession is power. But confession also is encouragement. The psalmist experienced it in verses 1 and 2. He said, blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven. Blessed is the one whose Lord does not count against, them, against any of them. Whose spirit is, there's no deceit. The psalmist experienced the, the liberation, the, what it means to be encouraged, to be blessed. The pastor um, Pastor Mike Hollow, the pastor of the church that I attend to in Trinity downtown, he was preaching the other day about the Beatitudes, and he has this, uh, uh, I'm going to quote him, his definition of blessed. So bear with me for a minute. Blessed in Scripture refers to someone who is in favor with God. So it's not a blessed life because we have money or because we have, you know, cool clothes or, or whatever. We have a good, good car, good, we live good. No, it's because we have favor with God. It's living in honor. It's the difference between immediate gratification and deep satisfaction. It's the difference between investment and indulgence. Blessed is the person who knows their purpose, goal, meaning, and life in life and faithfully lives into it. Being blessed. So we receive through confession clarity of our, of our goals, of, of who we are, of our purpose, so that we can live faithfully into it. That's what the blessed life is. That's what the psalmist experienced. That's what 
um, Peter also experienced. And lastly, confession is power. Power to be regarded and renewed. I like Eugene Peterson's version on this. He says, God defiers are always in trouble. God affirmers find themselves loved every time they turn around. At the end of John's gospel, in chapter 21, we see Peter having breakfast with Jesus and with his friends in the shore. What an amazing experience again. Jesus the cook. I mean, awesome. And then had like this intimate conversation, one-on-one, -on -one, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Take care of my sheep. After denying Jesus, he's renewed, he's regarded, he's welcomed back into the community of the forgiven, he's protected, he's covered with, through confession with the power of God. What a way to be regarded. Listen to this. What a way to be regarded. Take care of the flock for which I have given my life. Now that's something major. That's a renewal. Confession is renewal. Renews us. Makes us anew. It is not a one thing to go to heaven. It is not just one thing. I confess my sins one time. We need to understand our condition. Be self-aware of who we are and who God is. So that we can come into his presence. And ask for forgiveness. And be specific. Ask the Holy Spirit to let us know what is going on in our hearts. I'll end with this. Miroslav Volv says, and I quote, There is no happy, successful, beautiful, interpersonal relationship without forgiveness. End of quote. But I'm going to read it again. There is no happy, successful, beautiful, interpersonal relationship without forgiveness. Now, in order to be forgiveness, there has to be Confession. And again, that's what happened in the hotel room in Chicago, Sunday the 17th. I learned about my biases, not because I was a, aware of them, because my family helped me. You were wrong when you did this. And because I was humble to say, you are right, can you forgive me? Confession to God. Confession to others. Confession is the power that guides us toward experiencing the richness of life within the community of the forgiven. Could you please close your eyes? Today, God is in our midst as always. We acknowledge his presence. Take a deep breath to consider the state of your inner being, the state of your soul. And I ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you how do you feel? Are you anxious? Are you uncertain? Is there fear of any kind in your heart? Are there any doubts? Do you feel vulnerable and exposed? Are you in need of clarity and discernment? Do you sense God's calling and you lack the courage to respond to it for a new season? Then, between you and God, say it clearly. Be specific. Say, Lord, this is how I feel, and I need you. I want to experience the power that comes through confession. And in a, in a way of, of doing this and, and embodying it, Put your hands like this in front of your mouth, like this, and whisper. Whisper there your confession, and then release it to God. 
whisper, Lord, this is how I feel. I need your forgiveness. And then just release it. He's here. He listens. He's aware of who you are. And he wants to bless you, to cover you, and to guide you. Lord, we are in your presence. And you know our hearts and our states today. You love us so much. We confess to you that we have done wrongs. Make them clear. And surround us with people with deep spiritual roots so that they can also speak truth to us. And that we can join completely in its full richness the community of the forgiveness. We release it to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for your time. You are sent.